Paul, we're at the FQXI conference, uh, and it's our fifth. Uh, we dealt with questions in the past on cosmology, time, information, physics of the observer. This time we're integrating broader concepts, a little bit of consciousness, existence. And one of the topics that's come up is the gap between life and not life. Number one, why is this an important topic and how does it relate to the fundamental physics that is our, our core interest? This is my great passion at the moment. This is my major research program, trying to answer the question, what is life and how did it arise from non-life? Uh, and there is this um, sort of glib statement you'll hear a lot of even distinguished scientists making that, uh, oh, um, uh, the, on the early Earth there were complex chemicals mm -hmm. and that these sort of organized themselves into a living Lightning thing. Bolt. And that given Earth-like conditions elsewhere, the same sort of thing would happen, no big deal. Uh, but people fret over whether, uh, once life gets going on a planet, whether intelligence would eventually evolve. And right. I think that that could be uh, a major problem, going from simple to complex uh, intelligence. But getting to the simple uh, is very is, is, is yeah, very simple. Right. I think this easy. is exactly wrong. Yeah. Uh, and the reason is that we, um, we understand the mechanism whereby uh, single cells can uh, eventually achieve something like the complexity of a human being, and it's called Darwinian evolution. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to uh, ask a biologist, uh, given uh, bacteria on some other planet, how likely is it that you get intelligent life there in another three billion years? We don't know how to do the, the calculation, but at least we know the mechanism that did it. When it comes to the transition from non-life to life, we don't know what that mechanism was. Darwin famously said, uh, it is mere rubbish at this time thinking about the origin of life. One might as well think about the origin of matter. Yeah. Well, uh, the truth is that we still do not know the physical process, the pathway whereby chemicals turned into life. Uh, obviously, there was such a pathway, but we don't know what it was. If you don't know the mechanism, you can't estimate the odds. It's impossible for us to say. Uh, just how likely it was that a, a mishmash of chemicals turned into something as complex as a cell. It, it's a huge gulf. So c conventional wisdom says that if you mix the chemicals together, you throw lightning bolts at it, or that y you will eventually pretty quickly be able to have simple life, but the Darwinian evolution to get to intelligent life, because there are so many branches and so much uncertainty and so, so many accidents, that that, even in the history of the universe, may be impossible to do it more than once. So the, that's where the, the big gap is, but between non-life and the chemical soup and life, it's fairly simple. No, see, I think that the big gap is that first step. So, 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 if the big gap is the first step, at least d define what what the boundaries are. How would you define the non-life? Maybe that's easy. And then, how would you define that first step of life that can then jump into the Darwinian evolution flow? Right now, this uh, subject has been dominated by chemists. I've got nothing against chemists uh, who have, over the last hundred years, tried to cook up life in the lab, and they see it as a problem of getting the right stuff, get the right sort of molecules, uh, sufficiently complex, uh, and the experiments in which you try to make the first steps down the road to life are fairly easy. And so you can make the building blocks of life, things like amino acids, uh, very easily indeed. Um, but that's as silly as saying uh, New York City is an amazing complex thing and we'd like to know how it came to exist. And then saying, we've solved the problem. Uh, this is how you make a break. <laughs> uh, and so it's assembling all those building blocks into this incredibly intricate thing that even uh, the simplest cell represents uh, that is the challenge. Now, I think it's not a problem of chemistry. Uh, if you go to um, biology department at the university and say, uh, what is life? You'll be given a narrative in terms of things like um, codes and signals uh, and translation and transcription. Uh, all of this stuff is information speak. Uh, that's the language of biology. It's it's about information. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a chemistry department, you'll be told, well, life is, you know, this is RNA and DNA and uh, amino acids making peptides and proteins, and you'll be given that sort of chemical hardware view. Now, the chemistry is the substrate in which life, as we know, is instantiated. But what makes life seemingly magical, what makes it so different from 
just any old complexity, non-living complexity, is the way it organizes and manages and stores information. So I focus in on that information storage and management aspect. And for me, the true problem about life's origin is the, uh, I call that the software of life. It's the coming into existence of that software, not the, the hardware stuff, the, uh, because uh, there'll be some chemistry there somewhere that can do it. But it, how did that first step about organizing the information in this particular way arise. N nobody has a clue, I have to say, that this is, this is not like we've got 100 competing ideas. <laughs> nobody knows uh, how uh, just stupid atoms blundering around uh, can turn into an information management system uh, in which you have both digital and analog information being stored and processed uh, in a very, very complex network uh, with certain informational motifs and patterns that are very distinctive in, in life uh, and will be quite different in a mishmash of uh, yeah. chemical. I have to tell you that 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 your uh, 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 skepticism in terms of the uh, the ease of the transition from non-life to life is. Um, is is not a common one. Uh, a lot of uh, scientists uh, think that that's that's a that's a problem that can be solved. And we know how to, we haven't solved it yet. But nobody has really that I, I know who has put it so so uh, dramatically that that is a real fundamental gap. Right. Th those scientists have no justification whatever for making the claim that it's an easy transition. Uh, now, if you believe that there is some sort of deep life principle interwoven into the laws of nature that somehow against the raw odds uh, encourages matter to fast track towards life, uh, so be it. Then I imagine we could get to this uh, amazing information processing state of affairs fairly quickly. But if there is such a principle, we haven't found it yet. And uh, to, to simply say it's going to happen without invoking a life principle uh, I think it's just wishful thinking. What, what is that first minimum step that you need to have? What is the absolute minimum that you need to go from uh, in, in that, the way you describe it as an information management system, uh, that you have chemicals, inert chemicals in the environment? What is the first step that becomes self-perpetuating? Uh, well, there, there are two things. Why, the self-perpetuating has to do with the the replication uh, and the replication, or, or, or it takes off from and there. Then, what, what, what do you yeah, have to do to kick, uh, or, kick it well, off? Well, you know, von Neumann had uh, some uh, prescient ideas along these lines. So he was talking about self-reproducing machines, uh, and uh, it's easy to imagine something like a three D printer. You can you can make a copy of something, uh -huh. and, and then the copy can make a copy. But his great insight was to see uh, that. It's, it's not sufficient that you just make a, a replica of something. You've got to make a replica of instructions to make the replica and insert that into the system. Uh, and life does this uh, in, a, in a very obvious way. So DNA has two quite different functions. Um, uh, two things can happen to DNA. One is that it can have its uh, base pairs read out uh, by a molecular system, reads it out. These are the instructions for making a protein. So that's operating in one particular way as information storage. The other thing that can happen to DNA is it can be unzipped and replicated as a, a just a dumb object. It does, it does, it's not doing anything. It's not instructing, not encoding, not uh, driving anything. Just it's just si sitting there uh, and being replicated. And the cell has to know uh, what it's going to do. How is it going to do, do this to the DNA? When has the time come? Uh, to replicate it. Uh, and so there is a sort of epigenetic, uh, nobody knows really how it works, management system that the cell program, in some sense, uh, has to has to make that judgment. And von Neumann saw that r way back in the 1940s, 1950s, mm. that, you, that that was the key step, that you have to not just replicate the object, but replicate the instructions that go with the object and insert it in and decide when you're treating something as a, a, a instruction set and when you're treating it as just a physical object to be replicated. If, uh, if this is going to be solved between life and not life mm -hmm. and that gap bridge, do you guess it will be a f one fundamental principle or just a, a, a general understanding of a host of things that sort of work together? Well, I like the idea of you know one fundamental principle. Um, and I have for decades flirted with the idea that uh, we have these laws that refer to physical objects, dynamical laws uh, for a atoms and so forth, um, that there should be laws that govern the flow and organization of information. 
uh, and that these are not um, somehow violating the underlying laws of physics that apply to the substrate, the atoms in which the information is instantiated. Uh, they complement it, but they can't be reduced to it. And we see this uh, very forcefully at this meeting, I have to say, uh, that information is discussed as if it's a thing. Uh, now, um, a, a good analogy is with energy. So energy is an abstract quantity, and yet it can be conserved, passed on, changed from one form to another, but, but it's still the same amount of energy. So information is a bit like that. It can, uh, can be um, passed on from one system to another and conserved in some way. Uh, it's got a life of its own, and I think there must be laws of information management and organization, which we have yet to write down, and, and that, at that point we will be getting close to answering this.